Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Global Judicial Integrity Network podcast series. We're here today with Chief Justice Pereira of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. So thank you so much um, for agreeing to speak with us today. Um, For all of our listeners, could you please first tell us a little bit about your professional background? Yes, Uh, thank you. My professional background is basically um, a lawyer to Mm -hmm. begin with. Um, I graduated in 1979 and from law school in 1981. Then was admitted Mm -hmm. to the bar Mm -hmm. uh, in one of the territories, the territory of the Virgin Islands. I practiced for over 20 plus years and then joined the bench in 2003. So uh, you are now the Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, yes. uh, which was set up in 1967, I believe, Yes. at least in its uh, current con- configuration. Mm-hmm. So what benefits has this c- consolidation brought to the states and its jurisdiction? Well, basically, when you think of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, um, before that, of course, uh, you had the what they call the federal Supreme Court. Uh, now you have what is styled, it was first the West Indies, West Indian Associated States Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. Then it was restyled, the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. Um, it's a court with a single jurisdiction across nine islands. They comprise six mm-hmm. independent states and three British overseas territories. Mm-hmm. And so they go from the north, uh, the territory of Angola, Mm. down to the south, which is the state of Grenada. Mm -hmm. And um, do you think it's maybe improved efficiency to have everything consolidated this way, that it's one court for all of those uh, those areas? Yes, it has, to me, tremendous benefits. Mm -hmm. Um, We basically, the bulk of those states, they come from a common law background. There are laws, even though there may be slight nuances and Mm -hmm. uh, differences, uh, the laws are more or less the same. And what you also get from that regional uh, outlook is where you are able to serve the people Mm -hmm. of the Eastern Caribbean uh, across those nine states, drawing on experiences Mm -hmm. from other states, Mm -hmm. and so it's enriching, and um, it allows also for cross ideas, Mm -hmm. cross Mm fertilization, and drawing from different backgrounds. Um, If I may, you mentioned that there are slight nuances in the law systems between the countries. Can I just ask how you you kind of manage that? Okay. Take, for example, the state of St. Lucia. Mm St. Lucia has what we call a hybrid system. It's a system which has a civil code Mm -hmm. and parts of it is also the common law. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting mesh of common law mixed with the civil code and basically interpreting the code and then finding differences where the common law uh, may intersect Mm -hmm. with certain provisions of the code. Sometimes it's challenging. It does sound a bit challenging. (laughs) But um, quite interesting. It makes the law quite interesting Mm -hmm. uh, from St. Lucia. The others, basically, the other states are mainly common law and other, you know, domestic laws passed Mm -hmm. by Parliament. Um, What challenges in general do you think smaller smaller jurisdictions face? Um, or, or even what challenges do small island nations face um, related to, to, to the, judiciary. the judiciary? Well, basically, I think in terms of smaller jurisdictions, of course, your, your populations would be smaller. Mm-hmm. Even though we have nine states, it's, it's a population serving less than, let us say, under a million mm-hmm. uh, people. Um, of course, those that more or less three quarters of a million. It's scattered across mm-hmm. the nine mm-hmm. states. They're separated, of course, mm-hmm. by water. And so we draw, our judges may come not only from within the Eastern Caribbean jurisdiction, they may come from further afield. Uh, they may come from other parts of the Caribbean region. Mm-hmm. And so 
you may know, uh, let us say, legal practitioners, or you may really know people when you are judging. Mm -hmm. And that poses sometimes the, the most challenging aspect of the job, particularly mm -hmm. if you're assigned, for example, to an island where you have a small population, let us say, take the state of the territory, rather, of Montserrat, mm -hmm. where the population is now about 5,000. Okay. It is unlikely <laughs> that you will not know, particularly if you have been serving that island, that they mm -hmm. won't know you, or you know them, or have some sort of perhaps there may be family relationships. So it would pose a problem mm -hmm. uh, in that regard so in terms of size. How do judges usually approach this challenge? Do they tend to recuse themselves if they uh, if they know someone, or in the instance where in a population of five thousand they know everyone? Is that then not seen as a conflict of interest if they know the person? Invariably, what you may find, and this is what we practice, and I suppose it goes back to even questions perhaps of looking at gender biases, mm -hmm. where in our system, what we do to seek to avoid those sorts of conflicts or biases that may arise is that a judge, let us say, that is assigned, let us say, to that territory mm -hmm. would hardly ever come uh, from within that territory. I see, okay. And so we tend to assign perhaps another judge from another state, mm -hmm. maybe Grenada, that, you know, they're not really known to that particular mm -hmm. community. And is this kind of issue, um, so do you, do you face similar issues with members of judicial councils where they, they would also then know, uh, they would also then know prospective appointees as well? Yes, our system, we have um, what we call the Judicial and Legal Services Commission, and it's basically the OECS Commission. Mm -hmm. um, we have members, for example, it's chaired by the Chief Justice. Uh, there's provision for another judge of the court, whether a high court judge or a judge of the Court of Appeal. And then we have members, maybe a representative from three states in mm -hmm. rotation. Okay. So they would serve for about three years, and then there's a rotation of mm -hmm. those persons. Mm -hmm. um, that way, you're not really having the same persons who will be making the selections or knowing you know, persons mm -hmm. or applicants mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for judicial appointments at any particular point in time. The Chief Justice, of course, would mm -hmm. because... Uh, the Chief Justice, of course, is also president of our Court of Appeal mm -hmm. and will travel. It's an itinerant court, so mm -hmm. we will travel across all nine states. Okay. So quite naturally, we would get to know the legal practitioners in each particular state. In a way, in, in terms of selection, sometimes that's, I think, a plus because you, are, you get an idea as to uh, work ethic, mm -hmm. um, the capabilities and qualities of persons and legal practitioners who are practicing before you. Um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned that it's a traveling court. Yes. So does this mean then that the court then operates out of different judicial buildings in on the different uh, yes. territories? But not the high court levels, because the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court is made up of two levels, mm -hmm. the high courts and the court of appeal. Mm -hmm. So the high courts would be established in each of the nine states and territories. Um, there may be perhaps two criminal courts, sometimes two to three civil courts, but the Court of Appeal, there's one mm -hmm. Court of Appeal, and that Court of Appeal travels mm. every other week to a different Every other state, week? Every other week. Oh, wow, okay. To a different state okay. or territory. Okay. I was, I was going to ask, you know, you mentioned you know, being geographically separated by water. Yes. I was going to ask about access to justice, but this, yes. is, a, this is clearly your solution is that, you, is that you travel among them. Yes. Um, I also wanted to ask um, about how you've used technology to, to improve the courts or improve efficiency, especially if you're separated like this. Oh, I think yes. it would be important. Um, that for us is critical. Um, you cannot imagine. I think our greatest cost is our travel costs mm -hmm. um, on an airline every other week, as well as hotel accommodations in various mm -hmm. states, transportation on the ground. 
So more and more we have been relying on technology. Mm -hmm. We use um, video conferencing. Mm -hmm. um, we have been doing a lot in terms of, let us say, for criminal matters, mm -hmm. uh, prison video link facilities as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain matters where we are able to link by video conference means, let us say, from St. Lucia or another state, mm -hmm. uh, wherever that may be. We also have the capability under our law, for example, if it's an urgent appeal from one state mm -hmm. and we're sitting in another and the schedule permits, we can easily move that appeal mm. to that state. Okay. And it's as if we're sitting in that particular state. Mm -hmm. um, so that helps, that sort of flexibility. Mm -hmm. Do you also um, have this kind of e-filing or online yes. court administration yes. Uh, software? Yes, we, we did. Firstly, we have the electronic case management, mm -hmm. but over the past two years, we have been moving to the e-filing. Mm -hmm. um, we are not completely finished with our implementation. We've been sort of going on a stage basis state by state. Mm -hmm. We've so far done five. We have another four to go. Mm -hmm. In fact, my team, they are in one of the states right now, um, linking up another of the states. And then we'll follow another during the course of March. Then we will have two more, hopefully mm -hmm. to finish by mm -hmm. the end of 2020. Um, that has been sort of exciting because it brings a new dimension um, even to not only the high court levels, but the court of appeal, where we would be traveling with bulks and bulks of, you know, paper right. and boxes, not cheap. And so now the idea that you can travel with, whether it's a, it's a thumb drive mm -hmm. or you can access your material mm -hmm. um, from your site makes it a lot easier at this point. So more and more we are relying on that. It's a lot of training that we have been undergoing. And of course, I suppose with every new system, we work at it to ensure that we are capturing, you know, the various bugs mm -hmm. in the system and sort of developing it as we go along to ensure that it's really what we need in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, the demands of our court to ensure that it works. Mm -hmm. Is there also a public platform where people can see the progress of things or where they can check uh, where things, you know, which location things are scheduled in? Because yes. I could imagine that would be yes. very useful. It is also, we, we would publish, for example, we have the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court's website. Mm -hmm. And on that we would publish listings, uh, trial dates, listings, and so on. And similarly, now you would be able to get, from whichever state, you can get an idea mm -hmm. as to the listings. Currently, we are doing that electronically, mm -hmm. as well as we would send out listings uh, by email. Mm -hmm. Yes, that sounds, it yeah. sounds like you have a very, um, a very well thought out system to, yes. to um, accommodate all of your needs. Well, actually, I think we were literally, I think, being forced to, to go <laughs> right, that right, right, right. Um, simply because um, just the challenge of moving documents um, from one place to another mm -hmm. um, can, be, can be quite uh, frustrating at times if, if you do not have that material. And so, even before that, what we were what we found ourselves doing was relying on emails. Mm -hmm. So if something was urgent, a legal practitioner would send the documents by email. Um, they would file them in the registry, let us say, in that state, and immediately transfer them by email to the headquarters, which is mm -hmm. in St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. So it operates where we have the central registry in St. Lucia, sub-registries in each of the states. Mm -hmm. So each state has its filing point, and it comes into the system, and then it goes to the central registry. So the electronic filing operates basically on the same level, but right now, uh, what it does is it allows the central registry to have greater control over the processes ah, okay. in terms of what was filed, mm -hmm. um, to ensure that it has been, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. Excellent in terms of 
you know, the Eastern Caribbean and, and the number of states vis-a-vis, mm -hmm. uh, -vis, for example, the judiciaries in the region, I suppose, mm -hmm. in a way uh, that court um, operates um, in the way that it does. Mm -hmm. And I think, in, yes, there are the drawbacks because you are in all of these islands, but yet there is the benefit, I think, of dealing, let us say, with a regional grouping, mm -hmm. which in itself can be beneficial uh, in terms of the progress that you make mm -hmm. and the impact overall that you can have. Yes, that's excellent. Yes. Thank you so much uh, for speaking with us today. And for everyone listening, stay tuned for more episodes in the Global Judicial Integrity Network podcast series. Thank you.